Tesla has pushed back new Cybertruck Foundation Series estimated delivery dates, which at first would suggest to you that Tesla is having some difficulties making the Cybertrucks, but I think this is actually good news. It was previously believed that Tesla would only make 1000 Foundation Series Cybertrucks. About 75 people showed Sawyer that they bought the Foundation Series Cyber Beast uh, Cybertruck. They were all originally given an early 2024 delivery date and not a single one of them has direct message Sawyer saying that there's a delay uh, for their order suggesting that Tesla simply is deciding to take more orders and that there are no production issues. Order conversion rates for these foundation Cybertrucks has been good based on the 230 people that got invited to configure and direct messaged uh, Sawyer, perhaps much better than Tesla expected, which may have resulted in Tesla wanting to make more than they initially thought they would. And as far as the 1000 number goes for the Foundation Series Cyber Trucks, I haven't seen anything officially from Tesla. That's just a number that someone perhaps made up or someone overheard, but there is no official confirmation from Tesla about the 1000 number, so I don't see this is a problem at all because nothing has been promised officially. Also, Tesla is able to sell FSD with every single cyber beast. You have to buy it. After we learned about these new delivery dates, we also quickly learned, this was a few hours after that, that Tesla has sent out another big wave of Foundation Series Cybertruck order configuration invites. Sawyer got 15 uh, direct messages very quickly and uh, some people didn't even get an email but they checked their configuration on Tesla's website on uh, their account and they saw that they are able to configure the Cybertruck so if you want to buy a Cybertruck go to Tesla's website and see if you are able to configure it maybe you will be able to do so and you don't even need to live in Texas or California anymore it looks like it's quite widespread this time now, how many Foundation Series uh, Cybertrucks will Tesla sell? Well, Tesla originally said that Cyber Whistle was limited, but then sold a ton of them, so it could be a large number. My guess is everyone who wants that Foundation Series Cybertruck will be able to get one because it is higher priced, it's a better margin vehicle as well for Tesla, so it will try to sell as many of these as it can, I think. And if you are not interested and you just have the regular Cybertruck reserved, then you'll just need to wait a little longer. Tesla is sending out this email to Cybertruck Foundation Series buyers. Your order is eligible for free PowerShare Home Backup Hardware. You just cover the installation cost. Take our survey to confirm your interest. We will reach out to you with more information and connect you with a Tesla certified installer. And if you are getting the Tri-Motor Cyberbees Foundation Series, you get a 4,000 installation allowance on top of that. The all-wheel drive though with uh, two motors uh, will not get the $4,000 installation allowance. I haven't seen a comparison like this before. We know that the Subject will use substantially less copper because of the 48 volt architecture, but this is comparing it directly to other vehicles and the Subject will use about 60% of the copper compared to how much F-150 lining needs to use. And um, an ICE vehicle still uses substantially less, but you know, there's no battery in a gas-powered vehicle, so that's not exactly a fair comparison. And Bloomberg expects it to take 10 to 15 years to fully transition to 48 volts. I assume that includes all automakers. So Tesla is 10 to 15 years ahead based on that estimate. This is just speculation, and likely this is not going to happen, but there's a small possibility, a very tiny possibility, that one reason why the Model 3 refresh in the US is delayed is because maybe they are trying to build it on the 48 volt architecture. I don't think so. But there is a tiny, tiny possibility that is the case. Certainly, we could make that argument for the Model Y refresh next year. I would hope and sort of expect, I would give it maybe a 50% chance that it is going to be built on the 48 volt architecture, which would be really nice to see. It feels like Europe is making an anti-Tesla move. This morning, the German government announced they changed the deadline to apply for the 4,500 euro environmental bonus from December 31st to December 17th. I think only buyers to take delivery by 17th can apply. 
So it does feel like an anti-Tesla move. And the timeline of events is very interesting. On December 12th, Tesla announced a 0.99% interest rate for leases and loans in Germany. What a deal. The next day, the German government announced that the incentive of $4,500 to buy an EV ends this year. No more incentives for 2024. But on December 16th, they say it is ending now and not at the end of December. However, if you actually look at what's going on, you will realize that Germany is seriously going through something big right now. They have a bit of a financial crisis at the moment. There's a debt crisis. Well, not really, but by um, German standards, yeah. They think they are going through a crisis. So they are cutting their expenses like responsible people would. And I think Tesla just got caught up in the middle of all of this. And uh, Troy actually later admitted that, yeah, uh, he thinks that it's related to the budget crisis. It's not a direct anti-Tesla move, actually. So a big shout out goes to Troy for quickly changing his opinion once he learned all of the facts. I really respect that. This is Tesla's high fidelity assist, and I will definitely be using that. This looks pretty useful. And you can see all of the lines around your car. You have a full 360 view of your surroundings, making it easier to park your vehicle. Oh yeah, this is pretty good. And here is another demonstration. I didn't see this before. This is my first time watching this. And yeah, it looks pretty useful to me overall, but he's going really slowly. I guess he's just excited looking at this for the first time. Oh, and I like how uh, when there is something, the color changes. So, there, I, oh, I guess the closer you are, the more red it gets. It goes from yellowish to red. And you are able to turn it any way you like. So you can see absolutely every single thing around your car. Nice. However, there is one really weird thing. It's going to all cars without ultrasonic sensors that have hardware 3 and hardware 4, so that's good. But if you have ultrasonic sensors, which is what my car has, uh, yeah, if you have ultrasonic sensors, you're not getting this update. So personally, as a, a Tesla vehicle owner who has a Tesla with ultrasonic sensors, I'm not too thrilled about this, but it's. Uh, I think maybe they can update it later, but maybe not, so yeah. I'm a bit disappointed, but it's okay. The Tesla Giga Mexico factory will use municipal wastewater in the production of cars in a great effort to increase water sustainability in the region. It's probably a great idea, but it's a stinky subject, so I'm gonna move on. Elon Musk is making some big moves again with SpaceX. SpaceX is set to launch the first batch of direct-to-sell Starlink satellites that will allow for global cellular connectivity. This testing phase aims to pave the way for the eventual launch of the cellular Starlink system starting with text messaging next year and uh, with plans to introduce voice and data capabilities by 2025. I think a lot of phone carriers are completely overpriced. When I moved here to North America from Europe, my phone bill went up by about 10 times. My usage remained exactly the same. And there are so many of these companies in the world and some of them are pretty big. So imagine if SpaceX was basically able to take business from most of them, a big piece of business from most of these companies. That alone would make SpaceX an incredibly valuable company. Alexandra just conducted a poll. What will have a significant impact on Tesla's financial results first? Most people voted that the next generation vehicle will have the biggest financial impact on Tesla's balance sheet first before FSD, Robotaxi, and Optimus. I think that makes sense. FSD 12, unless it is close to solving full cell driving. I don't think it will make much of an impact immediately. So I think this is generally right. And between Robotaxi and Optimus, this is quite interesting because one way to think about it is, well, solving full cell driving should be easier than building an Optimus bot that has general AI. I mean, if you build general AI, then 
you have certainly built a robotaxi, but the flip side of that argument is to make a robotaxi work, it has to be perfect every single time. But to have a useful Optimus bot, I mean, if it drops a dish or if it drops your clothes by accident when it's doing your laundry and it does that maybe one time out of 10 times it picks up uh, a t-shirt, no big deal, no one dies. So there is a good case to make that an Optimus bot could have financial impact on Tesla's uh, future first before Robotaxi will. But as an investor, do I really care in what order this is going to happen? Or do I care more about will these things happen? I just care about will these things happen and will Tesla be the first company to do all of these things in a significant way? And I think Tesla will be the first company to do it. So I don't really care in what order is going to happen as long as it happens. In today's interview, Elon Musk says that some advertisers that paused spending on X last month are already returning to the platform. Exactly as I expected and exactly as I pointed out uh, yesterday, I think, when I saw Netflix uh, returning to advertise on X. Farzad has a really good post here. X has already won. Elon Musk closed the acquisition of Twitter, now X, in October of 2022. Feels like it was just yesterday. Once that deal was closed, a bunch of advertisers left the platform out of fear of their brands being impacted by the new freedom of speech rules that X was looking to implement. The premise was that ads would be shown next to content that advertisers don't want to be associated with, and because X would now allow more improper content, the chances of having a negative ad experience could increase. By the way, whenever I see an ad anywhere, almost always, unless it's the thing that I want to buy, which is very rare, it's always a negative experience. So all of the people that see your ads, generally, they already have a negative experience. So this doesn't really change much. It's only bad if there is negative media attention about your company because you are advertising on the platform. The negative attention is not from the ad itself. It's from media saying you should not advertise and that potentially damages your brand. That's where the problem is, I think, mostly. After leaving the platform for a few weeks, almost all the advertisers have come back. This is last year. Albeit with lower ad spends. However, earlier this year, X gave guidance that the platform is near cash flow neutral minus debt obligations. This means that even though the platform has suffered losses in terms of ad revenue, the company is close to being self-sufficient. In other words, no outside cash has to be brought into the company to keep it alive as long as the trend continues, which I believe it will. Not only will it continue, I believe, at some point, it will actually uh, accelerate. The revenue will accelerate. Fast forward a few months and after controversial comments made by Elon and an effort by Media Matters to encourage advertisers to boycott the platform, advertisers left again. However, just like the first time after a few weeks, advertisers are beginning to come back. There's confirmation that Netflix is back and uh, other advertisers are coming back again, as we just learned from Elon. For that says, I think all of this points to something quite clear. The Overton window is beginning to shift and with it a massively profitable endeavor for advertisers. The Overton window is a term used to express what is acceptable to be discussed in a given time period. If you compare what is acceptable to be discussed on X today versus what was acceptable on Twitter pre-acquisition, you can very clearly see that the acceptable topics are much more diverse and plentiful. Absolutely. This means that the Overton window has shifted. Another example of this is also on YouTube, and I think Farzad makes a really good point here a few days ago. Mario hosted a space with Elon Musk, Alex Jones, Andrew Tate, and other folks discussing Alex's reinstatement and a bunch of other topics. These topics, pre-acquisition, would not be admissible under Twitter's former rules. What's really interesting is that after making this edited content available on YouTube, which got millions of views, I think now all of these clips got millions of views, YouTube has not taken down the content from the platform, which is okay, but that's sort of expected. But more importantly, it allowed to monetize the content. That is a big deal. It is 1.4 million views. You put together all of these clips, it's definitely millions and millions and millions of views. And this is important because this implies 
that advertisers are now becoming comfortable advertising on content that they were not comfortable with in the past. What does this mean for X? It's quite simple. X's willingness to stand for free speech even then the CEO makes statements that cause the business to temporarily lose revenues, creating a brand new market for advertisers that previously did not exist precisely due to an unwillingness to embrace freedom of speech. And make no mistake, the temporary loss of revenue in the moment does not seem temporary at all. Elon was talking about bankruptcy. It looked permanent from the outside, at least to some degree, certainly. And because X's entire approach has been to uphold freedom of speech and accept the repercussions that come with it, the platform has positioned itself as the premier place for content that will be generated on this principle. And I have zero fear of being banned on X. But when I speak about something on YouTube, at least until now, I was like, oh, will this get me in trouble? Just mentioning Alex Jones, will it get me in trouble? Just mentioning Andrew Tate, will it get me in trouble? And my answer to that question was, if it gets me in trouble, so be it. I'll just go on X and I will blast YouTube till the day I die, was my thinking. I gotta say, I'm pretty happy that YouTube is making this move. I'm happy with it. This same content is a market that advertisers have had zero access to in the past because of the unwillingness of platforms to embrace freedom of speech and the skittishness of ad agencies to sully their brands with controversial topics. On top of this, it's a market that is untapped, which will generate billions of views and billions of dollars for creators and advertisers alike. I like that. I do not suspect we will see another advertiser's boycott in the future because of this dynamic. I disagree with that. I think it will happen multiple times on X, but each time it's just going to be less and less significant. It's going to be, ugh, it's just another one of those. There are going to be some people that will constantly complain about these things that Elon will say, and then some advertisers will leave for a day, and then they will come back the next day spending maybe even more money because Twitter slash X will get bigger and there's more advertising spots to buy. I don't think it will have any meaningful effect going uh, forward. Because you can only use that weapon so many times. Oh, we're leaving, we're leaving, we're leaving. Oh, but you, you, you came back. So it doesn't mean anything when you say you leave. Because you just come back always. It's losing, they are losing their power. But even regardless of that, I think Farzad does have a point that uh, it, it's less likely to happen now going forward. I do not suspect we will see another advertiser's boycott in the future because of this dynamic. There's way too much money to be made and now that the Overton window has shifted to where the public is now comfortable with listening to dissenting and controversial opinions, advertisers will be tripping over themselves to advertise on X over the long term. In my opinion, people respect the notion of being allowed to think for themselves and because this has been subdued for far too long, there will be an avalanche of interest for content that is specifically challenging and controversial. Oh, that's 100% right. Ultimately, this will be massively profitable for advertisers due to the engagement and attention it will receive from the public. Farzad is also right here. I posited when Elon bought the platform that X would win if they could make freedom of speech profitable and I think we are starting to see glimpses of this being the case. For a moment, can we just appreciate all of the goodness that Elon Musk has done here, also introducing community nodes? That's a big change. So let's have a moment of silence for all of these Elon Musk skeptics, haters, enemies that said that Twitter is not even going to survive after Elon takes over. My recommendation to them is to grow food themselves. Or like and subscribe so that you can see my future videos. That way you stay informed and you don't make stupid decisions and you don't have these flawed ideas. To me, from day one, it was abundantly clear that eventually Elon Musk will turn Twitter into something widely successful. And we are seeing the first glimpses of that. X users are spending more time on X than before. And that's the most important metric. Thank you for watching and I will see you in tomorrow's episode.